for the Experts in Emotion interview, we'll have the honor of speaking with Dr. Jessica Tracy. Um, Dr. Tracy is an Associate Professor of Psychology at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada, where she's also a Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research Scholar and a Canadian Institute for Health Research New Investigator. She received her PhD from the University of California, Davis in 2005. Dr. Tracy's research focuses on emotions and emotion expressions, and in particular on the self-conscious emotions of pride, shame, and guilt. Dr. Tracy's research has been covered by numerous media outlets, including ABC's Good Morning America, NPR's All Things Considered, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, The Boston Globe, The Economist, The New Scientist, and Scientific American, among many others. So I now turn to our Experts in Emotion interview, with Dr. Jessica Tracy. So welcome Jess, thanks for speaking today. Thank you, thanks for having me. So I thought what we could do is start off a little bit by asking you about what first got you interested in emotion in the first place. Sure, yeah. Um, so I started grad school in the late 90s, early 2000s, and at that time emotion was sort of the hot topic. I think it's still pretty hot, but at that time it was the new thing that kind of everyone was studying. And I learned that, you know, kind of upon entering grad school, and it was great because emotion was something that I sort of had this <clears throat> kind of intrinsic interest in. And I think that's for a couple of reasons. One is that I've always kind of been most interested in basic level processes, things that sort of go on in the mind that direct everything else. Um, I think my, my sort of orientation has always been, you know, how could I study something complex like relationships or group behavior without first knowing what's going on within one person's mind that's guiding all that. And I'm, I'm amazed by people who do work on that stuff because, you know, that's sort of my, that's the way I understand things. Um, and so, you know, I think emotions are so essential. They shape so much of what we do and what we want and how we think and behave. And at the time, you know, at the time I got into studying them, I feel like there was actually sort of a perfect amount of scientific understanding. There'd been all this great work done by people like Paul Ekman and uh, Richard Lazarus and Bob Levinson, and, and you know, at that point we knew emotions were biological and, and they could be studied through the scientific method, but there was still also a great deal of mystery, and I think there still is. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's always made them sort of this really fascinating topic of inquiry. So. Very cool. So I want to ask you some uh, questions about your own research, where you've really been a pioneer in this domain of self-conscious emotions. So, I mean, like I'm saying, you've just conducted some of the most influential work in this domain. And as an expert in self-conscious emotions, I wanted to just sort of pick your brain and ask you sort of, what do you see as the most important or, you know, unique features of self-conscious emotions? Yeah, so I would say self-conscious emotions, the way that I've always defined them, and I think this is consistent with mm -hmm. definitions that are out there, the, way they, the reason that they differ from other emotions is because of the self, and that sort of goes with the name. But the idea is that to feel a self-conscious emotion, you have to make a self-evaluation, which means you have to use sort of the I-self, the self that's the reflector, and actually reflect on the me-self, which is sort of your self-representations, your identity, your self-concept. Um, and once you start doing that, you know, you make a self-evaluation. Essentially, you sort of think, well, how does the I feel about the me? Do, do I feel good about myself? Did I just do a good thing or a bad thing? Mm -hmm. And that results in emotions like shame, guilt, pride, embarrassment, and so on. And, you know, I think that's a very unique feature of these emotions. Other emotions like anger, fear, sadness absolutely can involve self-evaluations, but they don't have to, right? You can experience fear without thinking about yourself at all. Whereas for these emotions, you have to. And I think that makes them unique, and it also makes them I think really interesting, especially as a social personality psychologist, because they're kind of intricately interwoven with some of the processes that we all care most about, right? Things like self-esteem, narcissism, self-concept formation, self-awareness, um, all kinds of interesting stuff that um, I think lots of self or self researchers for sure, but social researchers have always been interested in. So, so what do you think are some of the most important next steps then? As this field of self-conscious emotions kind of you know charts ahead, you know forward? Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's been a good body of evidence building suggesting that at least two self-conscious emotions, pride and shame, are biological, uh, universal, probably innate. Um, this means that they're likely to be adaptations, and this is kind of how I study stuff, it's sort of from a very evolutionary perspective. And so from that angle, you know, I think one big question is, um, you know, to what extent are these emotions sort of as core or basic as an emotion like anger? or fear. And to some, to some extent, this is sort of a semantic issue. Um, you know, if something's in, innate and evolved, it's innate and evolved. It doesn't really matter how core or basic it is, whatever that means. But on the other hand, I think that neuroscience could be really useful in terms of figuring out what's different in the brain 
when you experience something like pride versus happiness. There's got to be a difference, right? <laughs> Otherwise, there wouldn't be different emotions. So what is that difference, and how does that help us understand the difference between these two emotions? Um, I think cross-species work could also be really useful. What other animals do we see these kinds of emotions in? What are the evolutionary precursors? And then I think, in a whole other direction, social uh, social effects of these emotions, right? There's been a lot of work on the social impact of various emotions and, and growing body of work on the social impact of pride and shame and guilt. And I think that's where you know much more is needed because I think these are some of the most important emotions that we have in terms of shaping social behavior, right? How we are in our relationships, how we are as groups. Um, and they have huge effects on things like you know prejudice, war, patriotism, all kinds of stuff. And so I think that, that's a really kind of exciting direction for stuff. So, I mean, in this realm, I mean, what's really exciting is some of the work you've done, right? So you've conducted this, you know, seminal work sort of systematically describing and empirically documenting the nature of pride, right? And I wonder, for those of us, we all have, maybe have some sort of intuition of what pride is, but, you know, what are the core features of pride really, you know, from this scientific perspective that you've taken for the first time? <laughs> yeah, no, thanks. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so when I started studying Pride, we kind of built on definitions that were out there, largely from appraisal theorists, people like Richard Lazarus, who said, well, Pride is the emotion you experience when you've done something you feel good about, or you are someone that you feel good about, right? Basically, it's a positive self-evaluation. And so taking it from that, we kind of did a bunch of research to find, well, first of all, actually, there's two different ways of feeling Pride, right? There's what we call authentic Pride, which is feeling good about something you did, right? And then there's hubristic pride, which is more feeling good about who you are as a person. It's a little bit more arrogant, a little bit more global and stable. Um, and it turns out that these two kinds of pride are really different, both in terms of how they feel, but also in terms of what kinds of social effects they have, right? So they lead to different behaviors. Uh, when you feel hubristic pride, you actually become less empathic toward others, and you might even feel prejudiced against people who are different from you. Authentic pride actually promotes all kinds of pro-social behaviors. Hmm. And they have divergent personality correlates as well. So people who tend to feel authentic pride are agreeable and conscientious and high achieving, whereas people who tend to feel hubristic pride are much more aggressive, uh, disagreeable, uh, intolerant, that sort of thing. So it's really kind of interesting distinction. Um, and then I guess the other kind of main finding I've, I've done is that their pride is, is expressed through you know, its distinct nonverbal signal, which is you know, reliably recognized and displayed by people all over the world. So. Yeah, I was going to ask, to what extent do you think pride really is this, you know, cultural universal emotion? You know, I mean, the data would suggest it is. I think, you know, we, we've done studies where we went to Burkina Faso, which is West Africa, and found that the people who lived in a teeny little tribe there in the middle of nowhere, they, you know, almost never seen a white person. We showed them photos of the pride expression, and they recognized it. And they mm -hmm. recognized it as well as they recognized pretty, other, every other, pretty much every other emotion that we showed them. Um, wow. Which to me is fairly convincing, yeah. Um, we've also found that People all over the world spontaneously display this expression. I'm like doing it now um, <laughs> after success. It's hard. It's hard to talk about it and not do it. But it's work. Um, so people all over the world spontaneously show it, and that even holds for people who are congenitally blind. So these are people who've never seen anyone show the pride expression, and yet after they've had a success, that's exactly what they do. And it's hard to come up with an explanation of why these people are how they would have come to learn about it if it wasn't sort of an innate universal phenomenon. It's so fascinating. I mean, I know you've also done some work. I wonder if you could say a little bit about how do displays of pride even influence things, you know, as a sort of, you know, socially gigantic in terms of influencing social power or status. How, how can yeah. that display, you know, do just that? Right. Yeah. Right. Well, that's certainly, that's, that's an idea that's been around for a long time. I think, mm -hmm. you know, as early as people began thinking about pride in psychology, which isn't actually that early, um, they sort of talked about it as a high power emotion or a status emotion. And in, in work that I've done with uh, Azim Sharif, what we found is that when people show the pride expression, other people, upon seeing it, have this automatic, really unavoidable tendency to assume that the person showing it deserves high status. Hmm. And this tendency to see the pride expression as high status, it's unique to pride. We compared pride with lots of other emotions, including things like happiness and anger, which are also pretty powerful emotions. Mm -hmm. Pride far beats them. And then we found that even if, even if the people know that the person showing pride doesn't deserve high status. So for example, we had a homeless person showing pride. This is sort of the lowest status segment of society. And then we had a business person. And it turns out that when the homeless person shows pride, he, in this case it was a he, he is perceived to be as high status as a business person who shows shame, which is a low status wow. emotion. Wow. Yeah, so I mean, it really shows yeah. that these emotions have these incredibly strong effects that can overwhelm sort of rational judgment that we base on contextual cues. And we found that the effect of pride on status perceptions generalizes across cultures as well. So for this one, we went to Fiji, another sort of highly isolated, small-scale society, 
um, out in Fiji. It's very isolated. And we did this onomaticity study where we had laptops, which these people had never used, and we measured the reaction times. And sure enough, they also associated the pride expression with high status uh, very reliably. So. Wow. That's fascinating. That like and just, I love how you're conducting your work just all around the world, too, because I think so much of understanding an emotion is understanding the different potential cultural influences or to what extent your findings are robust to culture, right, and that they're universal. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, you know, I mean, I, I've sort of more taken the universalist pr sort of perspective, but I, I think there's mm -hmm. lots of stuff that's influenced by culture. Self-conscious emotions are absolutely influenced by culture. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's incredibly important, too. So mm -hmm. I think it's important to you. I wanted to ask about one other really important domain of work you've done that I've been reading about. I know a lot of other people have that's just got really important behavioral health you know, consequences. So you've been looking at to what extent self-conscious emotions like shame can actually predict things like relapse or worsening among alcoholics in terms of you know, severity. I wonder if you could say a little bit more about this. Yeah, no, that's, I'm glad you asked about that. That's a really new study that we have that I'm yeah. super excited about. Um, yeah, so what I did for this project was um, we kind of had, I'd been studying shame for a while and, you know, you get, you get people who are undergrads to write about their shame experiences. And they're good, you know, so you get stories like, oh, I broke up with my girlfriend, I felt really bad, I forgot to call my mom. It's good shame, but it's not sort of real intense shame. And so thinking about this, I thought, well, you know, people who are recovering from addiction, addiction is so linked to shame. I mean, as a clinical psychologist, I'm sure you know that. And the kind of shame experiences that people who are recovering from alcoholism have are just almost in a different realm from the undergrads that we were looking at. So what we did was we did this study where we had alcoholics, recovering alcoholics, come into the lab and talk about the last time they drank and felt badly about themselves for it. So it's sort of a shame induction procedure, but it's almost getting at shame specifically about their addiction. And the theory behind this is, um, you know, a lot of people, especially policymakers, and there's a number of judges out there who've sort of said, well, if you did something wrong, you should feel shame about it. And in fact, that's exactly how you stop doing that wrong thing. You feel badly about it, and then you fix. You mm -hmm. fix it. Mm -hmm. And while that may be true for guilt, and June Tangney has done a lot of work showing that guilt has all these positive effects in the moral domain, for shame, it's, it's less clear that that's the case. Because when you feel shame, you sort of feel like this bad person. And rather than make you, you know, want to fix things, it makes you want to hide and run away. And drinking alcohol for, for an addict is a great way of running away. It's a really good escape. And so our predictions were that, well, actually, if you feel shame about your addiction from alcohol or your addiction to alcohol, it's not going to make you stop drinking. It's actually going to have the reverse effect and make you kind of feel like you need to escape that shame, perhaps by drinking more. Hmm. Yeah. So what we did was we had these alcoholics come into the lab. They've been sober about three months, so newly sober. And the relapse rate for people who've been sober about three months is incredibly high overall. Um, it's just that's sort of how it works. Um, and they came into the lab and they talked about the last time they drank and felt bad about it. And we, we, we videotaped them while they did that. And then we measured their nonverbal behaviors. And the great thing about shame is you can actually measure it from people's behaviors. It's associated with things like a head tilt down, shoulder slump, chest narrowed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, right. Yeah. So we had a team of coders rate the extent to which they showed shame. We then had everyone come back about four months later. It varied, but on average, it was four months later. And when they came back, we measured their health. And we measured their health the first time, too, through questionnaires. And we also asked them about whether they had drank since the last visit. Now, we didn't say, did you drink since, since the last visit? Because that's sort of a, a question that's a little mm -hmm. bit almost biased. Instead, we just asked, when was the last time you drank? And we figured it out from that. And we also asked, how many drinks did you have over the past three months? And we, we gave them a calendar, and they had to fill in. And people are generally pretty good at remembering this kind of thing when you give them a calendar. Um, what we found was that the extent to which they showed shame in their bodies at that first session strongly predicted whether they had relapsed when they came back three months later or four months later. Yeah. And for those who did relapse, the, the extent of shame that they showed predicted how many drinks they had. In other words, how bad the relapse was. And that's even getting rid of the people who didn't relapse at all, so it's not driven by that. And they also had worse health. Um, so, mm -hmm. so it's really consistent with what we expected, that in fact, shame seems to be a predictor for relapse. And, and we you know, controlled for all kinds of other variables that might be sort of third factor stuff that could contribute to both, like depression and low self-esteem. None of that was, was accounting for this. It's really the shame behaviors we think that are driving this effect. That's fascinating with such important translational health outcomes too that you can link from the basic science world to you know, the clinical yeah. health world. 
Yeah, no, I would love that. You know, I'm not a clinical scientist, but I love the idea that I'm actually doing something that could help people. That's not something I've done in the past, so it's exciting. Yeah. So, I mean, you've really done just this beautiful body of work from like just really bringing the, the field of self-conscious emotions to life, looking at pride, and then this recent work on shame and linking it to alcoholism. And as you think about sort of where the field was when you started, where you've come, you know, during that time, if you look ahead sort of where do you see the future of this field going? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, I mean, I think the easy answer to that is more neuroscience, but, you know, the reason it's the easy answer is because that's been the answer since I got into the field, um, you know. <laughs> And in fact, when I got into the field, I was told, if you're going to study emotions, you're going to have to do neuroscience. And, you know, I have no problem with neuroscience. It's just never been my thing. And so far, I haven't gotten into it. I'm getting more into sort of physiological stuff. I've done some research with cortisol. Um, but, you know, I haven't gotten into the hardcore neuroscience stuff. And I think, you know, it, I do want to point out that you can do really important emotion work just by looking at behavior. I think, you know, behavior is an incredibly important window into this stuff. And, and that will never change. So... Um, so there is that. Um, and, you know, I think what I would say is, I guess, I don't know if this is the actual future, but maybe my hope for the future is um, I'd like to see more sort of ecologically valid work, maybe more field work. I think that, you know, like all, um, certainly all social psychology, but maybe all social and cognitive and a broad range of fields, affective science has been really kind of taking place in the lab. Right. It's mm -hmm. so experimental. And, and that's important, important. And emotions are something that I think are great to study with experiments because we can manipulate them for the most part. But I think that what goes on in the lab is really different than what goes on in the real world. And I think we really need more studies going on in the real world, measuring actual emotions that occur mm -hmm. out there with different populations, not just undergrads, you know, basically studying people in their natural habitat. So I guess that's my hope for the future. It's a good hope for the future. <laughs> and so when you have students come to you and ask you for advice who are thinking about embarking in this field, what do you tell them? Um, I guess, you know, what I would say is the thing you could start by doing is reading. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's the most important thing. You know, when I, when I started um, grad school in 1999, the first thing I did when I wanted to study emotions was I read this big book that came out in 1995 by Ekman and Richie Davidson. That was this questions book. You probably know this book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, so it's, they asked like kind of 10 or 12 questions about emotions. And then they had all the leading emotion researchers give their little answer to the questions. It's totally out of date now. But it was great because... You know, it told me, okay, here are the major issues, right, the questions, and here's what each thinker thinks, and here are the debates. And I just felt like I learned so much about the field from reading that. Now, that book, I don't think they've, they've done a new edition, although they should, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, the Handbook of Affective Science, Handbook of Emotions, all those kinds of things, I think you're, you're going to get the leading experts telling you what the big issues are and what their opinion on those issues are. And, and that's, I think, the way to start. You've got to know what we know before you can kind of move on from that. And then, you know, Read, read journals, read the journal Emotion, right? I think it's a great journal, it's a, it's a really good resource. And um, you know, if, you're, if you're interested and this is what you wanna study, you should be reading at least the titles and maybe abstracts of every issue, you know, to know what's going on in there. And then the articles for the ones that you're actually interested in. So reading, I would say that's, that's the way to start. Reading, excellent advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wanted to say thanks for speaking today, Jess. It's been really, sure. really awesome talking to you. No problem, happy to do it. Yeah. So this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Jessica Tracy from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Thanks again.